Hello and welcome to Sleep Cove, the podcast and YouTube channel to get a great night's sleep. This bedtime story is the classic Arabian Nights tale of Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves. Please check out my YouTube channel for other bedtime stories including other Arabian night tales such as Aladdin. If you prefer your bedtime stories with music, this recording is also available with relaxing music on my channel. Please do not listen to this recording whilst driving or operating heavy machinery. Please listen in a place where you can safely go to sleep. And let's begin. Arabian Nights Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves In a town in Persia lived two brothers named Kasim and Ali Baba, between whom their father at his death had left what little property he possessed equally divided. Kasim, however, having married the heiress of a rich merchant, became, soon after his marriage, the owner of a fine shop, together with several pieces of land, and was in consequence, through no effort of his own, the most considerable merchant in the town. Ali Baba, on the other hand, was married to one as poor as himself, and having no other means of gaining a livelihood, he used to go every day into the forest to cut wood and lading, therewith the three asses which were his sole stock in trade, would then hawk it about the streets for sale. One day, when he was at work within the skirts of the forest, Ali Baba saw advancing towards him across the open a large company of horsemen, and fearing from their appearance that they might be robbers, he left his asses to their own devices and sought safety for himself in the lower branches of a large tree, which grew in the close overshadowing of a rock. Almost immediately it became evident that this very precipitous rock was the goal towards which the troop were bound, for having arrived they alighted instantly from their horses and took down each man of them a sack which seemed by its weight and form to be filled with gold. There could no longer be any doubt that they were robbers. Ali Baba counted forty of them. Just as he had done so, the one nearest to him, who seemed to be their chief, advanced towards the rock. And, in a low, distinct voice, uttered the two words, Open sesame. Immediately, the rock opened like a door. The captain and his men passed in and the rock closed behind him. For a long while, Ali Baba waited, not daring to descend from his hiding place, lest they should come out and catch him in the act. But at last, when the waiting had grown almost unbearably, his patience was rewarded, and the door in the rock opened, and out came the forty men their captain leading them. When the last of them was through, shut Sesame, said the captain, and immediately the face of the rock closed together as before. Then they all mounted their horses and rode away. As soon as he felt sure they were not returning, Ali Baba came down from the tree and made his way at once to that part of the rock where he had seen the captain and his men enter, and 
and there, at the word, open sesame, a door suddenly revealed itself and opened. Ali Baba had expected to find a dark, gloomy cavern. Great was his astonishment. Therefore, when he perceived a spacious and vaulted chamber lighted from above through a fissure in the rock, and there spread out before him lay treasures in profusion, bales of merchandise, silks, carpets, brocades, and above all, gold and silver, lying in loose heaps or in sacks, piled one upon another. He did not take long to consider what he should do. Disregarding the silver and the gold that lay loose, he brought to the mouth of the cave as many sacks of gold as he thought his three asses might carry, and having loaded them and covered them with wood so they might not be seen, he closed the rock by the utterance of the magic words which he had learned, and departed for the town, a well-satisfied man. When he got home he drove his asses into a small court, and shutting the gates, carefully he took off the wood that covered the bags and carried them to his wife. She, discovering them to be full of gold, feared that her husband had stolen them, and began sorrowfully to reproach him. But Ali Baba soon put her mind at rest. On that score, and having poured all the gold into a great heap upon the floor, he sat down at her side to consider how well it looked. Soon his wife, poor, careful body, must needs began counting it over piece by piece. Ali Baba let her go on for a while, but before long, the sight set him laughing. Wife, he said, you will never make an end of it that way. The best thing to do is dig a hole and bury it. Then we can be sure that it is not slipping through our fingers. That will do well enough, said his wife, but it would be better first to have the measure of it. So while you did the hole, I will go round to Cassim's house and borrow a measure, small enough to give us an exact reckoning. Do as you will, answered her husband, but see that you keep the thing secret. Off went Ali Baba's wife to her brother-in-law's house. Cassim was from home, so she begged of his wife the loan of a small measure, naming for choice the smallest. This set the sister-in-law wondering. Knowing Ali Baba's poverty, she was all the more curious to find out what kind of grain so small a measure could be needed. So before bringing it, she covered all the bottom with lard, and giving it to Ali Baba's wife, told her to be sure and be quick in returning it. The other promised to restore it punctually and made haste to get home, and there, finding the hole dug for its reception, she started to measure the money into it. First she set the measure upon the heap, then she filled it, then she carried it to the hole, and so continued till the last measure was counted. Then, leaving Ali Baba to finish the burying, she carried back the measure with all haste to her sister-in-law, returning thanks for the loan. No sooner was her back turned than Cassim's wife looked at the bottom of the measure, and there, to an astonishment, she saw, sticking to the lard, a gold coin. What? she cried her heart filled with envy. 
Is Alibaba so rich that he needs a measure for his gold? Where then, I would know, has the miserable wretch obtained it? She waited with impatience for her husband's return, and as soon as he came in, she began to jeer at him. You think yourself rich, she said, but Alibaba is richer. You count your gold by the piece, but Alibaba does not count. He measures it. In comparison to Alibaba, we are but grubs and groundlings. Having thus riddled him to the top of her bent in order to provoke his curiosity, she told him the story of the borrowed measure, of our own stratagem, and of its results. Kasim, instead of being pleased at Ali Baba's sudden prosperity, grew furiously jealous. Not a wink could he sleep all night for thinking of it. The next morning, before sunrise, he went to his brother's house. Ali Baba, said he, what do you mean by pretending to be poor when all the time you are scooping up gold by the quart? Brother, said Ali Baba, explain your meaning. My meaning shall be plain, cried Kasim, displaying the tell-tale coin. How many more pieces have you like this that my wife found sticking to the bottom of the measure yesterday? Ali Baba, perceiving that the intervention of wives had made further concealment useless, told his brother the true facts of the case and offered him, as an inducement for keeping the secret, an equal share of the treasure. That is the least that I have the right to expect, answered Kasim haughtily. It is further necessary that you should tell me exactly where the treasure lies that I may, if need be, test the truth of your story, otherwise I shall find it my duty to denounce you to the authorities. Ali Baba, having a clear conscience, had little fear of Kasim's threats, but out of pure good nature he gave him all the information he desired, not forgetting to instruct him in the words which would give him a free passing into the cave and out again. Kasim, who had thus secured all he had come for, lost no time in putting his project into execution, intent on possessing himself all the treasures which yet remained. He set off the next morning before daybreak, taking with him ten mules laden with empty crates. Arrived before the cave, he recalled the words which his brother had taught him. No sooner was open sesame said than the door in the rock lay wide for him to pass through. And when he had entered, it shut again. If the simple soul of Ali Baba had found a light in the riches of the cavern, greater still was the exultation of a greedy nature like Asim's. Intoxicated with the wealth that lay before his eyes, he had no thought but to gather together with all speed as much treasure as the ten mules could carry, and so, having exhausted himself with heavy labour and excitement, he suddenly found, on returning to the door, that he had forgotten the key which opened it. Up and down, in and out, through the mazes of his brain, he chased the missing word, Barley and maize and rice, he thought of them all, but of sesame never once, because his mind had become dark to the revealing light of heaven, and so the door stayed fast, holding him prisoner in the cave, where to his fate, undeserving of pity, we leave him. Towards noon, the robbers returned, and saw, standing about the rock, Ten mules laden with crates. 
At this they were greatly surprised and began to search with suspicion amongst the surrounding crannies and undergrowth. Finding no one there, they drew their swords and advanced cautiously towards the cave, where, upon the captain's pronouncement of the magic word, the door immediately fell open. Cassim, who from within had heard the trampling of horses, had no doubt that the robbers were arrived and that his hour was come. Resolved, however, to make one last effort at escape, he stood ready by the door, and no sooner had the opening word been uttered than he sprang forth with such violence that he threw the captain to the ground. But his attempt was vain. Before he could break through, he was mercilessly hacked down by the swords of the robber band. With their fears thus verified, the robbers anxiously entered the cave to view the traces of its late visitant. There they saw piled by the door the treasure which Cassim had sought to carry away, but while restoring this to its place, they failed altogether to detect the earlier loss which Ali Baba had caused them. Reckoning, however, that as one had discovered the secret of entry, others might know of it, they determined to leave an example for any who might venture thither on a similar errand, and having quartered the body of Cassim, they disposed it at the entrance in a manner most calculated to strike horror into the heart of the beholder. Then, Closing the door of the cave, they rode away in search of fresh exploits and plunder. Meanwhile, Cassim's wife had grown very uneasy at her husband's prolonged absence, and at nightfall, unable to endure further suspense, she ran to Ali Baba, and telling him of his brother's secret expedition, entreated him to go out instantly in search of him. Ali Baba had too kind of a heart to refuse or delay comfort to her affliction. Taking with him his three asses, he set out immediately for the forest, and, as the road was familiar to him, he soon found his way to the door of the cave. When he saw there were traces of blood he became filled with misgiving. But no sooner than he had entered than his worst fears were realised. Nevertheless, brotherly piety gave him courage. Gathering together the severed remains and wrapping them about with all possible decency, he laid them upon one of the asses, then bethinking him that he deserved some payment for his pains. He loaded two remaining asses with sacks of gold, and covering them with wood, as his first occasion, made his way back to the town, where it was yet early. Leaving his wife to dispose of the treasure borne by the two asses, he led the third to his sisters-in-law's house, knocking quietly so that none of the neighbours might hear was presently admitted by Morgana, a female slave, whose intelligence and discretion had long been known to him. Morgiana, he said, there's trouble on the back of that ass. Can you keep a secret? And Morgiana's nod satisfied him better than any oath. Well, he said, your master's body lies there, waiting to be pierced, and our own business now is to bury him honourably, as though he had died a natural death. Go and tell your mistress that I want to speak to her. Morgiana went to her mistress, and returning presently, bade Ali Baba enter. Then, leaving him to break to his sister and all the news, and the sad circumstances of his brother's death, she with her plan already formed, hastened forth and knocked at the door 
of the nearest apothecary, and, with tears in her eyes, besought him to supply her in haste with a certain drug that is given to sick people only in the last extremity. Meanwhile, the rumour of Kasim's sickness had got abroad. Ali Baba and his wife had been seen coming and going, while Morgiana, by her ceaseless activity, had made the day's pretending illness seem like a fortnight. So, when a sound of wailing arose within the house, all the neighbours concluded, without further question, that Kasim had died a natural and honourable death. But Morgiana had now a still more difficult task to perform, it being necessary for the obsequences that the body should be made in some way presentable. So, at a very early hour, the next morning, she went to the shop of a certain merry old cobbler, Baba Mustafa by name, who lived on the other side of the town. Showing him a piece of gold, she inquired whether he was ready to earn it by exercising his craft in implicit obedience to her instruction. And when Baba Mustafa sought to know the terms, first, said she, you must come with your eyes bandaged. Secondly, you must sew that I put before you without asking questions. And thirdly, when you return, you must tell nobody. Mustafa, who had a lively curiosity into other folks' affairs, boggled for a time at the bandaging and doubted much of his ability to refrain from question, but having on these considerations secured the doubling of his fee, he promised secrecy, readily enough, and taking his cobbler's tackle in hand, submitted himself to Morgiana's guidance and set forth, this way, that she led him blindfold, till she had brought him to the house of her deceased master. Then, uncovering his eyes in the presence of the dismembered corpse, she bade him get out thread and wax and join the pieces together. Baba Mustafa plied his task according to the compact, asking no question. When he was done, Morgiana again bandaged his eyes and led him home, and giving him a third piece of gold, the more to satisfy him, she bade him good day, and departed. So in seemliness and without scandal of any kind, were the obsequiences of the murdered Cassim performed, and... When all was ended, seeing that his widow was desolate and his house in need of a protector, Ali Baba, with brotherly piety, took both the one and the other into care, marrying his sister-in-law according to Muslim law and removing with all the goods and newly acquired treasure to the house which had been his brother's and having also acquired the shop where Cassim had done his business, he put it to his own son, who had already served an apprenticeship to the trade. So, with this fortune well established, let us now leave Ali Baba and return to the robber's cave. Thither, at the appointed time, came the forty robbers bearing in hand fresh booty, and great was their consternation to discover that not only had the body of Cassim been removed, but a good many sacks of gold as well. It was no wonder that this should trouble them, for so long as anyone could command secret access, the cave was useless as a depository for their wealth. The question was, what could they do to put an end 
to their present insecurity. After long debate, it was agreed that one of their number should go into the town disguised as a traveller, and there, mixing with the common people, learn from their report whether there had been recently any case in their midst of a sudden prosperity or sudden death. If such a thing could be discovered, then they would make sure of tracking the evil to its source and imposing a remedy. Although the penalty for failure was death, one of the robbers at once boldly offered himself for the venture, and having transformed himself by disguise, and received the wise counsels and commendations of his fellows, he set out for the town. Arriving at dawn, he began to walk up and down the streets and watch the early stirring of the inhabitants. So, before long, he drew up at the door of Baba Mustafa, who, though old, was already seated at work upon his cobbler's bench. The robber accosted him. I wonder, said he, to see a man of your age at work so early. Does not so dull a light strain your eyes? Not so much as you might think, answered Baba Mustafa. Why, it was just but the other day that at the same hour I saw well enough to stitch up a dead body in a place where it was certainly no lighter. Stitch up a dead body, cried the robber, in pretended amazement, concealing his joy at the sudden intelligence. Surely you mean, in its winding sheet, for how else can a dead body be stitched? No, no, said Mustafa, what I say I mean, but as it is a secret, I can tell you no more. The robber drew out a piece of gold. Come, he said, tell me nothing you do not care to. Only show me the house where lay the body that you stitched. Baba Mustafa eyed the gold longingly. Would that I could, he replied, but alas, I went to it blindfold. Well, said the robber, I have heard that a blind man remembers his road. Perhaps, though, seeing you might lose it, blindfold you might find it again. Tempted by the offer, of a second piece of gold, Baba Mustafa was soon persuaded to make the attempt. It was here that I started, said he, showing the spot, and I turned as you see me now. The robber then put a bandage over his eyes and walked beside him through the streets, partly guiding and partly being led, till of his own accord Baba Mustafa stopped. It was here, said he, the door by which I went in should now lie to the right, and had in fact come exactly opposite to the house which had once been Cassim's, where Ali Baba now dwelt. The robber, having marked the door with a piece of chalk, which had been provided for the purpose, removed the bandage from Mustafa's eyes, and, leaving him to his own devices, returned with all possible speed to the cave where his comrades were awaiting him. Soon after, the robber and cobbler had parted, Morgiana happened to go out upon an errand, and as she returned, she noticed the mark upon the door. This, she thought, is not as it should be. Either some trick is intended Oh, there is evil brewing for my master's house. Taking a piece of chalk, she put a similar mark upon five or six doorways to the right and left, and having done this, she went home with her mind satisfied, saying nothing. In the meantime, the robbers had learned from their companion the success of his venture, Greatly elated at the thought of their vengeance, soon to be theirs, 
they formed a plan for entering the city in a manner that should arise no suspicion amongst the inhabitants. Passing by twos and threes, and by different routes, they came together to the marketplace at an appointed time, while the captain and the robber who had acted as spy made their way alone to the street in which the marked door was to be found. Presently, just as they had expected, they perceived a door with the mark on it. That is it, said the robber, but as they continued walking, so as to avoid suspicion, they came upon another and another, till before they were done, they had passed six in succession. So alike were the marks that the spy, though he swore he had made but one, could not tell which it was. Seeing that the design had failed, the captain returned to the marketplace, and having passed the word for his troop to go back in the same way they had come, he himself set the example of retreat. When they were all reassembled in the forest, the captain explained how the matter had fallen, and the spy, acquiescing in his own condemnation, kneeled down and received the stroke of the executioner. But, as it was still necessary for the safety of all that so great a trespass and theft should not pass unavenged, another of the band, undeterred by the fate of his comrade, volunteered upon the same conditions to prosecute the quest wherein the other had failed. Coming by the same means in the house of Ali Baba, he set upon the door at a spot not likely to be noticed, a mark in red chalk to distinguish it clearly from those which were already marked in white. But even this precaution failed of its end. Morgiana, whose eye nothing could escape, noticed the red mark at the first time of passing, and dealt with it just as she'd done with the previous one. So when the robbers came, hoping this time to light upon the door without fail, they found not one, but all six similarly marked with red. When the second spy had received the due reward of his blunder, the captain considered how by trusting to others he had come to lose two of his bravest followers, so the third attempt he determined to conduct in person. Having found his way to Ali Baba's door, as the two others had done by the aid of Baba Mustafa, he could not set any mark upon it, but examine it so carefully that he could not in future mistake it. He then returned to the forest and communicated to his band the plan which he had formed. This was to go into the town in the disguise of an oil merchant, bearing with him upon nineteen mules thirty-eight large leather jars. One of the jars, as an example, was to be full of oil, but all the others empty. In these he purposed to conceal the thirty-seven robbers, to which his band was now reduced and so to convey his full force to the scene of action in such a manner as to arouse no suspicion till the signal for vengeance should be given. Within a couple of days he had secured all the mules and jars that were requisite, and having disposed of his troop according to the prearranged plan, he drove his train of well-laden mules to the gates of the city, through which he passed just before sunset. Proceeding thence to Ali Baba's house, and arriving as it fell dark, he was about to knock and crave a lodging for the night. When he perceived Ali Baba at the door, enjoying the fresh air after supper, addressing him in tones of respect, Sir, said he, I have brought my oil at a great distance to sell tomorrow in the market, and at this late hour, being a stranger, I know not where to seek for a shelter. If it is not troubling you too much, allow me to stable my beasts here for the night. 
The captain's voice was now so changed from its accustomed tone of command that Ali Baba, though he had heard it before, did not recognise it. Not only did he grant the stranger's request for bare accommodation, but as soon as the unlanding of the stable of the mules had been accomplished, he invited him to stay no longer in the outer court, but enter the house as his guest. The captain, whose plans this proposal somewhat disarranged, endeavoured to excuse himself from a pretended reluctance to give trouble, but since Ali Baba would take no refusal, he was forced at last to yield, and to submit with apparent complacence to an entertainment which the hospitality of his host extended into the late hour. When they were about to retire for the night, Ali Baba went into the kitchen to speak to Morgiana and the captain of the robbers, on the pretext of going to look after his mules, slipped out into the yard where the oil jars were standing in line. Passing from jar to jar, he whispered into each. When you hear a handful of pebbles fall from the window of the chamber where I am lodged, then cut your way out of the jar and make ready, for the time will have come. He then returned to the house where Morgiana came with a light and conducted him to his chamber. Now Ali Baba, before going to bed, had said to Morgiana, Tomorrow at dawn I am going to the baths. Let my bathing linen be put ready, and see that the cook has some good broth prepared for me against my return. Having therefore led the guest up to his chamber, Morgiana returned to the kitchen and ordered Abdallah the cook to put on the pot for the broth. Suddenly, while she was skimming it, the lamp went out, and on searching, she found there was no more oil in the house. At so late an hour, no shop would be open, yet somehow the broth had to be made, and that could not be done without a light. As for that, said Abdallah, seeing her perplexity, why trouble yourself? There is plenty of oil out in the yard. Why to be sure, said Morgiana, and sending Abdallah to bed, so he might be up in time to wake his master on the morrow, she took the oil can herself and went out into the court. As she approached the jar which stood nearest, she heard a voice within say, Is it time? To one of Morgiana's intelligence, an oil jar that spoke was an object of even more suspicion than a chalk mark on a wall, and in an instant she apprehended what danger for her master and his family might lie concealed around her. Understanding well enough that an oil jar which asked a question required an answer, she replied quick, as thought and without the least sign of perturbation. Not yet, but presently, and thus she passed from jar to jar, thirty-seven in all, giving the same answer, till she came to the one which contained the oil. The situation was now clear to her, aware of the source from which her master had acquired his wealth, she guessed at once that in extending shelter to the oil merchant, Ali Baba had in fact admitted to his house the robber captain and his band. On the instant, her resolution was formed. Having filled the oil can, she returned to the kitchen, where she lighted the lamp, and then, taking a large kettle, went back once more to the jar which contained the oil. Filling the kettle, she carried it back to the kitchen, and putting it under a great fire of wood, had soon brought it to the boil. Then, taking it in hand once more, 
she went out into the yard and poured into each jar in turn a sufficient quantity of the boiling oil to scold its occupant to death. She then returned to the kitchen and having made Ali Baba's broth, put out the fire, blew out the lamp and sat down by the window to watch. Before long, the captain of the robbers awoke from the short sleep which he had allowed himself and finding that all was silent in the house, he rose softly and opened the window. Below stood the oil jars. Gently in their midst he threw the handful of pebbles, agreed on as a signal, but from the oil jars came no answer. He threw a second and a third time, yet again he could hear the pebbles falling among the jars. There followed only the silence of the dead, wondering whether his band had fled, leaving him in the lurch, or whether they were all asleep, he grew uneasy, and ascending in haste, made his way into the court. As he approached, the first jar a smell of burning and hot oil assailed his nostrils, and looking within he beheld in rigid contortion the dead body of his comrade. In every jar the same sight presented itself, till he came to one which had contained the oil. There, in what was missing, the means and manner of his companion's death were made clear to him. Aghast at the discovery, and awake to the danger that now threatened him, he did not delay an instant but forcing the garden gate, and thence climbing from wall to wall, he made his escape out of the city. When Morgiana, who had remained all this time on the watch, was assured of his final departure, she put her master's bath linen ready, and went to bed well satisfied with her day's work. The next morning Ali Baba, awakened by his slave, went to the baths before daybreak. On his return, he was greatly surprised to find that the merchant was gone, leaving his mules and all jars behind him. He inquired of Morgiana the reason. You will find the reason, she said, if you look into the first jar you come to. Ali Baba did so, and seeing a man, startled back with a cry, do not be afraid, said Morgiana, he is dead and harmless, and so are all the others you will find if you look further. As Ali Baba went from one jar to another, finding always the same sight of horror within, his knees trembled under him, and when he came at last to one empty oil jar, he stood for a time motionless, turning upon Morgiana eyes of wonder and inquiry. And what, he said then, has become of the merchant. To tell you that, said Morgiana, will be to tell you the whole story. You will be better able to hear it if you have your broth first. But the curiosity of Ali Baba was far too great. He would not be kept waiting. So without further delay, she gave him the whole story, so far as she knew it from beginning to end. And by her intelligent putting one thing against the other, she left him at last in no possible doubt as to the source and nature of the conspiracy which her quick wits had so happily defeated. And now, dear master, she said in conclusion, continue to be on your guard, for though all these are dead and one remains alive, and he, if I mistake not, is the captain of the band, and for that reason the more formidable, and the more likely to cherish the hope of revenge. When Morgiana had done speaking, Ali Baba clearly perceived that he owed to her not merely the protection of his property, but life itself. His heart was full of gratitude. Do not doubt, he said, that before I die, I will reward you, as you deserve. As an immediate proof from this moment, I give you your liberty. 
This token of approval filled Morgiana's heart with delight. She had no intention of leaving Sir Kaida Master, even had she been sure that all danger was now over. The immediate question, which now presented itself, was how to dispose of the bodies. Luckily, at the far end of the garden stood a thick grove of trees, and under these Ali Baba was able to dig a large trench without attracting the notice of his neighbours. Here the remains of the 37 robbers were laid side by side. The trench was filled again, and the ground made level. As for the mules, since Ali Baba had no use for them, he sent them, one or two at a time, to the market to be sold. Meanwhile, the robber captain had fled back to the forest. Entering the cave, he was overcome by its gloom and loneliness. Alas, he cried, my comrades, partners in my adventures, sharers of my fortune, how shall I endure to live without you? Why did I lead you to a fate where valour was of no avail, and where death turned you into subjects of ridicule? Surely, had you died, sword in hand, my sorrow had been less bitter, and now what remains for me is to take vengeance for your death and to prove by achieving it without aid that I was worthy to be the captain of such a band. Thus resolved, at an early hour the next day, he assumed a disguise suitable to his purpose, and going to the town, took lodging in a khan. Entering into conversation with his host, he inquired whether anything of interest had happened recently in the town, but the other, though full of gossip, had nothing to tell him, concerning the matter in which he was most interested, for Ali Baba, having to conceal from all the source of his wealth, had also to be silent as to the dangers in which it involved him. The captain then inquired where there was a shop for hire, and hearing of one that suited him, he came to terms with the owner, and before long had furnished it with all kinds of rich stuffs and carpets and jewellery, which he brought by degrees with great secrecy from the cave. Now this shop happened to be opposite to what which had belonged to Kasim, and now occupied by the son of Ali Baba. So, before long, the son and the newcomer, who had assumed the name of Kogia Hussein, became acquainted, and as the youth had good looks, kind manners, and a sociable disposition, it was not long before the acquaintance became intimate. Kogia Hussein did all he could to seal the protected friendship, the more so as it had not taken him long to discover how the young man and Ali Baba were related. So, plying him constantly with small presents, an act of hospitality, he forced on him the obligation of making some return. Ali Baba's son, however, had not at his lodging sufficient accommodation for entertainment. He therefore told his father of the difficulty in which Kogia Hussein's favours had placed him, and Ali Baba, with great willingness, at once offered to arrange matters. My son, he said, tomorrow, being a holiday, all shops will close. Then do you, after dinner, invite Kogia Hussein to walk with you, and as you return, bring him this way, and beg him to come to me. This will be better than a formal invitation, and Morgiana shall have a supper prepared for you. This proposal was exactly what Ali Baba's son could have wished, so on the morrow he brought Kogia Hussein to the door as by accident, and, stopping, invited him to enter. Kogia Hussein, who saw his object thus suddenly attained, began by showing pretended reluctance, but Ali Baba himself, coming to the door, pressed him in the most kindly manner to enter, and before long had conducted him to the table, where food stood prepared. But there an unlooked-for difficulty arose. Wicked though he might be, the robber captain was not so impious 
as to eat the salt of the man he intended to kill. He then began with many apologies to excuse himself, and when Ali Baba sought to know the reason, Sir, said he, I am sure that if you knew the cause of my resolution, you would approve of it. Suffice to say that I have made it a rule to eat of no dish that has salt in it. How, then, can I sit at your table if I must reject everything that is set for me? If that is your scruple, said Ali Baba, it soon shall be satisfied. And he said orders to the kitchen that no salt was to be put in any of the dishes presently to be served to the newly arrived guest. Thus he said to Kogia Hussein, I shall still have the honour to which I look forward to, of returning to you under my own roof the hospitality you have shown to my son. Morgiana, who was just about to serve dinner, received the order with some discontent. Who, she said, is this difficult person who refuses to eat salt? He must be a curiosity worth looking at. So when the saltless course was ready to be set upon the table, she herself helped to carry in the dishes. No sooner had she set on the eyes of Kogia Hussein than she recognised him in spite of his disguise. And, observing his movements, with great attention, she saw that he had a dagger concealed beneath his robe. Ah, she said to herself, here is reason enough, for who will eat salt with the man he means to murder? But he shall not murder my master, if I can prevent it. Now, Morgiana knew that the most favourable opportunity for the robber captain to carry out his design would be after the courses had been withdrawn, and when Ali Baba and his son and guest were alone together over their wine, which indeed was the very project that Kogiana Hussein had formed. Going forth, therefore, in haste, she dressed herself up as a dancer, assuming the headdress and mask suitable for the character. Then she fastened a silver girdle about her waist, and hung upon it a dagger of the same material. Thus equipped, she said to Abdallah the cook, Take your tabal, and let us go in and give an entertainment in honour of our master's guest. So Abdallah took his tabal, and played Morgiana into the hall. As soon as she entered, she made a low curtsy and stood awaiting orders. Then Ali Baba, seeing that she wished to perform in his guest's honour, said kindly, Come in, Morgiana, and show Kogiana Hussein what you can do. Immediately, Abdallah began to beat his tabor and sing an air for Morgiana to dance to. And she, advancing with much grace and propriety of deportment, began to move through several figures, performing them with a case and a facility which none but the most highly practised can attain to. Then, for the last figure of all, she drew out the dagger, and holding it in her hand, danced a dance which excelled all that had preceded it. In the surprise and change and quickness and dexterity of its movements, she presented the dagger at her own breast, now at one of the onlookers, but always in the act of striking, she drew back. At length, as though out of breath, she snatched his instrument from Abdallah, and with her left hand, and still holding the dagger in her right, advanced the hollow of the tabor towards her master, as is the custom of dancers when claiming their fee. Ali Baba threw in a piece of gold, his son did likewise, then, advancing in the same manner towards Kogia Hussein, who was feeling for his purse, she struck under it, and before he knew, had plunged her dagger deep into his heart. Ali Baba and his son, seeing their guest fall dead, cried out in horror at the deed. Wretch! exclaimed Ali Baba. What ruin and shame hast thou brought on us? Nay, answered Morgiana, it is not your ruin but your life that I was thus secured. Look and convince yourself what man was this who refused to eat salt with you. So saying, she tore off the dead robber's disguise, showing the dagger concealed below, and the face which her master now for the first time recognised. 
Alibaba's gratitude to Morgiana for thus preserving his life a second time knew no bounds. He took her in his arms and embraced her as a daughter. Now, said he, is the time when I must fulfil my debt, and how better can I do it than by marrying you to my son? This proposition, far from proving unwelcome to the young man, did but confirm an inclination already formed. A few days later, the nuptials were celebrated with great joy and solemnity, and the union, though auspiciously commenced, was productive of much happiness as lies within the powers of mortals to secure. As for the robber's cave, it remained the secret possession of Ali Baba and his posterity, and using their good fortune with equity and moderation, they rose to high office in the city and were held in great honour by all who knew them.